Andrea. My colleagues' names are Sierra Danforth, Jordan Seesaw, and Ekaterina Kurova. Uh, we are the Global Business Association, and this is our presentation on Paris Baguette. First, we start off with the, with the industry environment of the global big goods industry. We have a couple valuations that we estimated here. Uh, revenue comes in at $528 billion, and growth actually did quite well from 2013 to 2018, coming in at 3%. Next, we get a little more specific with the valuations. We have $84 billion in retail sales value in Euro. And this is also expected to grow quite significantly to $105.3 billion through 2021, which is not too far away from here. Uh, the business statement for Paris Forget is actually one of the more important things that we've looked at so far. Uh, Paris Forget, as they plan to grow, they really value culture. And when they go through each culture, uh, they make sure to emphasize this through the globalization strategy in which they keep about 20% or more of their menu steered directly to the culture's cuisine. And this really has provided success to them as they've gone through their continuous growth stages, which we'll talk about right now. So we have two visuals here. One is the store count that they have in different locations, and the next is the timeline in which they have grown throughout these countries. Uh, as you can see, through 2004 and 2000, through 2004 to 2014, they've grown quite significantly in which they've actually been expanding at a rapid rate, just really trying to diversify themselves. And through this visual right here, you can see the very South Korea dominant being a South Korean based bakery franchise. Uh, they actually own 80% of the market share in South Korea, but they've been doing their best to diversify themselves, and as you can see, China, the United States, Vietnam, is quite impressive. So we identified two strategic issues throughout this case. The first being where to enter in Europe. The second being what strategy they would utilize to enter in Europe. They had two options in which they kind of, two options in which they evaluated throughout the case. The first option was to continue what they do with the sales proposition of Frenchness while also combining it with the globalized menu as I spoke about before. Or they would plan to either pivot and change to where they would get a staple brand, a staple product, and then utilize that staple product to really master it and build a brand presence in that country through this product as they did in France and it proved to be quite successful for them as well. So our first test was to choose one country out of 50 European countries uh, where the Paris baguette success will be continued. And we analyzed the European market and we chose two potential countries, which are Germany and Italy. So let's have a look at uh, their economic uh, conditions because as you all know, number never, never, never less. So as you can see, uh, the bakery market uh, and the prediction, the predicted growth is higher in Germany than uh, in Italy and also the German GDP is the highest GDP in the whole European country and the German economy is growing very very fast currently. Also uh, there is uh, more potential uh, in Germany because uh, there are more people who can uh, buy our products and we consider that it's very important to take into account Human Development Index because it includes a per capita income indicator and uh, Paris Spaghetti target market is uh, upper class consumers. So these people have a lot of money to spend on our goods. So currently Italy is an economic crisis and we consider that uh, it is not a smart for luxurious brand to enter the economy which experience uh, economic drawback. It's worth noting that Germany is expected to report the highest GDP in the last seven years. So being a luxury brand, a premium brand that emphasizes that image, they can afford the nicer things. Germany can, as with the Human Development Index as it shows, they know what these premium uh, products will be. So it will be very important for us to enter this market and we can expect quite a lot of success by doing this. So there are some pros and cons of the uh, German market. So the biggest pros is the fact that uh, Germany is second largest brand and uh, bakery market 
and it's also very well uh, matured. Uh, their health trend is very, very important in Germany, and uh, as we know, Paris Spaghetti was labeled as a premium uh, health conscious bread. So uh, it's going to be our target audience. And there is also a very big Korean population, especially near Bel uh, especially near the capital of Germany. So uh, it will be easier for the company to penetrate inside the market due to this fact. There are some cons, such as uh, oversaturated market, and uh, uh, there is uh, older population, and sometimes uh, older generation is not uh, able to accept uh, some changes, like modern trends. So continuing on to our SWOT analysis, we have a bunch of capabilities that this company has. Um, starting with their vertically integrated supply chain, they have a great one. They have a lot of connections throughout France um, already for their products. They want the best that there is. And with their research and development, um, they go into the country first. They see what the consumers like. So they want to make sure that they're foolproof and they won't fail once they get there. Their globalization goes into the research and development. They want to make sure they keep their global brand, but also compare it to the locals and make sure that they know that they're there for them. Their um, delivery process and authenticity kind of work together. They want to make sure that they do have what the country wants, and they make sure that their delivery process shows that they're fresh. They deliver two to three times each day just to ensure that. So the weaknesses are the costs, which comes in, they have over a thousand ingredients, over 600 types of bread, but that can also be um, a capability also because they're very broad. They can, um, everyone will have something that they like through their company. And the same with the specific niche, they, um, it's a weakness because they choose to only like really go to upper class instead of going to everyone. And then the shrinking scales and stag growth will be discussed in the next slide. So the threats are um, the regulations, such as the Korean Fair Trade Commission. Um, they were doing great in Korea and they kept expanding, except then they put a cap on it. They can only grow within 2% um, annually and within 1,500 um, feet of another company, they can't put another store. So that really capped them. So they needed to get out of Korea and start going other places also. And the next is the German regulation about what goes into their certain food. We don't think this will be a problem, but they definitely have to keep an eye on it. And then small enterprises is another threat because that's their competition once they get into Germany. People like what they like, so you need to try to get them away from the places that they want to go. And then Tule Jour is their biggest competition, which we will talk about later. So opportunities are growth, both in the actual industry and for their company. Everything's growing and they'll continue to. Especially at the frozen market, it's growing about 8%. They already have part of their brands can be uh, frozen bread, so they should continue with that with this um, increased market. And then the other part was the French competition that they won. They can really use that to show that they're the best and that people should try them. So right here is the German competitors that we found. Um, that's part of their threats because that is who they have to go up against. They um, have been pretty dominant once they go, like they went into Paris and they made it. So we think that they can overcome these also. And then this is their biggest competitor. They're also from Korea. They're um, global. They're out there. They have the same things pretty much. They're established in 1997. They started the mass production, franchising. Their new items also included the same. They offered coffee, sandwiches. And then they started cafe style, which is also what Paris I get soon. And then um, these are the seven countries they're in at the moment. They're mostly in the Asian companies. They're dominating Vietnam right now. They're at the top because of the bread. And so far, we don't think that there's no sign there's going, that they're going to go to Europe. But we want to make sure we're there first because this is our biggest competition. It's also worth noting that they plan to open a thousand new stores in China alone and have 380 stores overseas worldwide. They have this company, their biggest competitor, actually has the most stores out of a Korean based bakery. So for uh, Paris to get, this is a, a definitely a big concern for them. So for our strategy, in Germany, it's actually the second most um, producer of the bread industry. 
So for our short-term goals, we are going to do research and development so we can further understand the German culture to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. So for our long term, we're going to penetrate the German market within the next five to seven years. And 2.6 big goods growth rate, um, even though it's a well-matured market, there's still low barriers to entry, so it'll be very easy for us to enter into this German market. Uh, we are going to continue using the innovative product mix, which is the globalized strategy that they used in the past. So, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, they use 20% of the local cuisine that they use. So that'll be including the pumpernickel bread and pretzels and sourdough. So that'll be 20%. And the rest of the 8% is going to be the global cuisine that they use around the world. Um, we're also going to be doing the vertical supply chain integration, just like they did in Paris for the authenticity. They use Paris, uh, the local suppliers, so they have that natural and um, local feel. So in Germany, when they do the pumpernickel, etc., that we're going to use the German suppliers to have this authenticity. We're also going to have our target market be the upper class consumers uh, to keep up with the brand image. Um, even though it asks for one European country, we are going to take a step further into this and we are going to look at Berlin specifically. Um, Berlin is the fifth most populated city in Europe. Um, there's actually a 2% population of Asians um, in the city of Berlin. So what they did in other countries is they looked in the cities where it's most populated by the Asian culture. Um, because since it's so recognized, um, they know this and they will, go, they will gravitate towards it. Um, so Berlin is actually a very trendy and hipster city. So they're very open to new trends. They want to jump on that right away. So that's another reason why we believe this would be very good. Um, looking even further into it, the borough of Charlottenburg, um, it's a very small borough within Berlin, um, has a very upscale atmosphere, so that'll really fit in with the brand image that they're looking for. Um, there's a shopping boulevard that has high-end boutiques, hotels. Um, one of the main things is the visibility. They want to be very visible in their franchise, um, a lot of walking area, um, parking, etc. So within this borough, something that they can really get their name out there with. Um, and once you look up the borough of Schadenburg, um, there's a little description that comes up saying, surrounded by Asian eater who's drawing an international crowd. So they really want to go with the South Korean feel and the brand recognition. So uh, we try to build a cost analysis, and uh, we based uh, this cost analysis on uh, franchise cost and uh, the prediction uh, investment opening the first store are going to be 1.2 million and we predict uh, sales per year, per year 6.3 and uh, return on investment are going to be 5.3 percent according to our calculations and predictions. So in synopsis we identified two strategic issues with this company. The first being where to expand into Europe and the second being how they would expand to Europe. The strategy that we chose was to keep what was working, keep the original strategy in which they kept the globalized feel of their stores with the 20% or more of the local cultures, and then brought in global cuisine, such as their world-renowned, the best in the world, in fact, French baguettes, as well as Korean desserts that had worked outstandingly in France, and more. Lastly, we also really tried to emphasize the vertical supply chain in which we kept local suppliers in which they would keep that authentic feel to any food that we would enter with. Then also, Germany was really emphasized because of everything that went into it. Because it's an older population dominant place, we have healthy food options with this company. And it's known, as Kate had said here, that it is a prestigiously healthy food eatery. Also, they provide high-end food, and this is really a part of their brand image, and this ensures that with a well-developed country such as Germany, the specific location of Berlin, the specific location of Charlottenburg, that this would be perfect for them because they have the money to be able to do it with the German economy being so well. And that's basically all. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions?